It's past eight. The Radio Whammo Breakfast. The voice of the creative economy. With Vincent Herringer. Back for the first time in 2011. Good morning to you, Vincent. Good morning, Wemo. It's, it's been, been too long. It has been far too long. It's that awkward time where you don't know, oh, should it be Happy New Year or not, or should we just move on from that? <laughs> oh, no. I'm always, I'm always happy with the new year. We still haven't taken our Christmas tree down. Oh, like, no. You make have. the season last. Oh, that's terrible. Actually, I can't talk. Cause up behind me, I've got uh, Christmas cards still um, hanging. So, yeah. yeah. That's, <laughs> Why stop the celebrations, I think. <laughs> Just keep them there till next year. Yeah, exactly. Hey, today we're talking about um, Chinese businesses and, um, well, I guess um, maybe it's not just Chinese businesses, but, but other businesses coming in from around the world and targeting our food industry for takeover. Yeah, an interesting uh, trend for 2011. We've already seen quite a lot of activity in that space, and I suspect it will continue for some time. It causes um, some really quite intense feelings amongst New Zealanders because... You know, it's one thing for a foreign company to come and buy our manufacturing businesses, but to buy into our land and to buy into our heartland industry of dairy and um, you know, beef and farm production, that really gets to the heart of what it means to be a New Zealander. Mm. And if the land is being bought by somebody else, what does that make us? It makes us tenants in our own country. Mm-hmm. That's the sentiment, at least, that uh, people feel anxious about. That's the, that's the emotional argument, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, and there's some practicality uh, aspects to it as well in that, um, well, I'll take, for instance, the latest, Wrightson, uh, PGG Wrightson, which is a large um, farm services business. I'm sure people will, anyone that's got any connection with the countryside will recognise the brand. So they uh, do um, things like they run um, retail outlets around the country supplying farmers. They also have um, a seed division, and they are, in terms of the Southern Hemisphere, one of the largest producers of seed for farming. And that implies intellectual property and science and R&D, all the stuff that we actually take real pride in in New Zealand, the science and technology around farming. Now, Wrightson's is um, experiencing a takeover bid at the moment from uh, both a Canadian outfit and a Chinese outfit. Mm. And I suppose, you know, the um, the real tragedy in that um, is that why can't we keep a company like that and grow it and, and internationalise it from New Zealand? We're already the seed division exports to many countries around the world, mostly in the Southern Hemisphere, but why can't we keep a company and grow it here in New Zealand rather is, than have to flog it off? Is it because um, the New Zealand public's obsession with buying property and putting investments and funds into property rather than um, investing in New Zealand business? That is, uh, is a one good uh, one explanation, and that's a very accurate one. And over the years, we've been under-investing in what economists call the productive sector and ploughing money into property which is a passive income and and is mostly domestic-focused rather than export-focused. So um, another example of... And so as a result, companies like Wrightson's can't tap into New Zealand capital to grow. Um, Another example was Sinlay, a um, a South Island uh, dairy company, one of the largest privately owned, as opposed to out being out... You know, as opposed to Fonterra, so it's out of the Fonterra network. It's the largest dairy... um, company, um, not just a dairy company but also investing in R&D, um, tried to raise capital to grow last year. Nobody wanted to invest in New Zealand, so it was sold 51% so a majority shareholding to a Chinese company called First Bright. Mm. But what, what, why do you think, though, that food production is, is starting to um, gain popularity amongst overseas investors? Well, I think... Um, the collapse of the property market internationally and also um, just the uh, the dynamics of the recession mean that companies and, and investors are hunting around for sectors that show promise and growth. And we know that lots of sectors have been flat, technology, property, manufacturing, um, but food, you know, food's one thing that continues to be needed. And um, you combine that, that with the growth in the middle classes in China and India and Brazil um, and you start saying, mm, geez, New Zealand's in a great position to actually be one of the contributors to that boom. I'd throw something else in there along with the, you know, the, those rising middle classes, but also the effects that climate change is having on, on um, food production. Um, I just saw a news story last night 
about um, the, one, the, uh, one of the biggest wheat growing regions. In fact, the, the region that provides two thirds of the wheat and grain to China, um, I think it's around the Shandong uh, uh, province, has, in, is, 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 is in drought right now. In fact, they've only had 12 millimeters of rain since September, and, um, and they don't know when the next rain is coming. Um, and, uh, and, and, and this is on top of the drought last year in Russia and the fires. Uh, Russia has already closed its um, exports for, for wheat and grain and says we can only feed ourselves, we can't export anywhere else. There's That's problems, amazing. of course, in Australia as well with all the, w- yes. the weather effects over there. The, the um, cyclone um, Yazi, is it, um, wiped out the entire right. uh, Queensland banana production. They're also saying that some of the, these problems in Egypt, um, the reason why the people have risen up, or one of the factors has been the, the price of food. Well, that's what sparked it in Tunisia as well, was the, the price of food and the and price of oil as well. And the UN has been warning about this for a long time now, and they say that um, it's only going to get worse throughout the rest of this year. Yeah, which is uh, uh, also an opportunity for New Zealand, being such a great producer of food. You know, we, we have great conditions, not the best conditions, it must be said. Um, um, in South America, you get even better growing conditions, particularly for dairy, but... You know, we we do have great conditions. We have a great heritage. We have a long history and um, and a great story to tell around our intelligence and science around farming. So we, we're, in theory, we're in a great position, Wamo, but where we are failing, and this has been well documented by people like the New Zealand Institute and and other um, researchers and economists who say New Zealand's great at producing middle-sized companies, but we have a real threshold of growing internationally. And apart from Fonterra and a handful of manufacturing companies, can you really think of a great New Zealand um, uh, multinational? Um, It's really hard to think of them because they don't really exist. And if we can't continue to grow beyond the New Zealand shore, so get an international scale business, Mm. we will just be continually open to being bought by foreigners. Is there is there any anything any light at the end of the tunnel? Can we end on this positively, Vincent? <laughs> well, I think the opportunity. I mean, this this is hard stuff. It's not stuff that you can fix overnight. It's, there's a whole infrastructure. There's a talent pool. There's money required, um, and it's not necessarily something that the government can fix either. You know, it's a real, it's a real systems problem for New Zealand. But I, I it can I, start by not tempting New Zealand investors when it actually does tempt New Zealand investors into business, but not tempting them into into stuff like power companies, which aren't exporting anything overseas. No, exactly. Um, and also, I think, getting to the heart of the, um, um, the commitment to what sovereignty means in New Zealand, not necessarily at a nationalistic, um, you know, government buying up things, but actually individuals saying, actually, damn it, I'm going to invest in New Zealand companies, I'm going to back them. Mm. In New Zealand companies having the balls, you know, the entrepreneurs having the, the balls to actually hold on to their companies. <clears throat> you know, these things are, are very personal decisions, in that they, but collectively, you know, you can make a difference. Mm. I think the, the other, just to finish on a positive note, um, Wemo, if you can understand why these things are happening, it makes you less xenophobic. So it's very easy, particularly when the Chinese are coming to invest, to um, kind of talk, you know, imagine the yellow peril or to um, become, you know, put up borders and become xenophobic about yeah. New Zealand. Actually, the answer is the opposite. It's actually to be having foreign direct investment, but using that to grow New Zealand companies as well. So being smart about it, not being, um, not being stupid about it. So somehow way. retain the control. Exactly. Invite the yeah. capital in, but is there a way to keep it um, 51% in New Zealand and 49% Chinese, yeah. et cetera? All right, thanks very much, Vincent. A pleasure, Wemo. Vincent Hearing, you can find blogging over at Idealog as well, idealog.co.nz.